So, thank you so much for showing up, first of all. And I, I'm both a little bit intimidated and a little bit very intrigued because you guys are such a cerebral crowd. And if you came here to think that I'm going to teach you or educate you about something you don't know, I highly doubt it. I should have mentioned when the uh, invitation went out that instead of a question and answer session, I think it will be a question session. This is <laughs> what I'm hoping to do here is to provide a backdrop for a very intriguing and thought-provoking discussion. Um, I actually, um, how I got on this subject at all, besides being incredibly fascinating, I don't come from a technology background, I come from a social science background. And it seems like social sciences are going towards, you know, there's, it's blending with, the, with technology studies, and you really can't talk about one without addressing the other. And that's the new techno-economic par paradigm that it seems that we're going towards. But more specifically, I was um, contacted by Jonathan Nugan, who is uh, the writer of the other book that I'm going to be talking about, which is The Curiosity Cycle. And he asked me if I wanted to uh, do a book review. And I recently finished it. It will um, appear in the next Compass, the uh, APF newsletter that is sent out. Um, so that kind of kept going. And it's been like uh, an explosion recently with books and literature that addresses not only technology in and by itself, but how it actually impacts society and, and the economic distributions uh, uh, as an effect of that. So I just wanted to start by showing you guys a picture of computers. <laughs> so these are, these are computers uh, and how computers used to look like. And uh, they are, they're working for NASA. And I uh, feel very uh, sure that most of these women sitting here can do most mathematical functions, trigonometry, calculus, much better than I can even dream. But one thing I wonder, if I was able to go back in time and talk to any of these women, and I told them that I can pull up a little rectangular device <laughs> out of my pockets and tell them that not only can I uh, do much of their work, actually replace them in many ways, but I can get access to almost any, any information ever known to map <laughs> by that. I can link up to a web of people all across the world instantaneously and almost cost free. I can feel almost sure that, or not almost sure, but there's a good probability that a child growing up in sub-Saharan Africa will have access to that technology which completely uh, outpowers their boss's computer back then, uh, and that that child might have more access to technology of that dimension than access to food, water, or sanitation. So obviously, you know, this new technological revolution that we're going into is bringing so many new opportunities that we did not have, but they come with their own threats and their own sort of creative destructions, if you want to call it that. And I felt that these two books sort of encapsulates the, the problem that we're discussing because, as I said, there's so many books out now. Uh, one that I, I haven't even had a chance to read it yet, but I wanted to, I, I will ask you guys uh, uh, later if you read um, Jeremy Rifkin's Zero Marginal Cost Society, which is really addressing this new third uh, 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 industrial revolution. Um, how the digital revolution is compacting the cost, so we, it's, it's, we're nearing zero marginal cost, which completely transform the economic environment that we're operating in. He believes that this is going to carry over to the Internet of Things, and we're going to be like in a post-capitalist society. So it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Mugen, he has a very interesting background, first of all, in uh, developmental psychology. He's also a computer scientist. He works, uh, he spends his day trying to teach machines to learn the way children learn. Uh, and he's actually at uh, UT, so uh, I don't know if any of you guys know him, but he's, that's where he is. 
Um, <clears throat> so the second machine age uh, are, is written by um, Brynjolfsson and McAfee, who are out of the uh, Sloan um, School of Management at MIT. So they're talking more about these macroeconomic uh, and social context that this new technological revolution is happening in. So I thought I felt like these are two important angles to kind of view it from. Um, so Mugen uh, spends a lot of time in his book talking about how humans learn. It's mainly a book about humans. It's, I, I like to see it as the first parenting book for futurists. Because futurists are interested in not only how you raise a child. A futurist is interested, how do I raise my child in this specific time context and in the future? So, um, and then that's why I sort of fell for this book so much too. And so he starts um, uh, explaining to us that uh, small children learn by individuating concepts in their surrounding. They don't have access to a whole lot of data, but of course everything is new and magical to them. So what they do is they will focus in, something like a zoom camera, focus in on one particular object and learn about that object by uh, building a model around it and then testing that model. So if, for instance, you have a child who's seeing his parents uh, turn a lever on the faucet, water coming out, water shutting off. So after a while, it's going to kind of get the idea of a faucet and what it's for. The water is coming out. So one day he might want to test that model about the faucet. So you might, you know, does water come out? Yes, it does. Uh, what happens when I fill up the, the sink? Will it continue to go up or will it maybe flow over? Well, he's going to learn two things. He's going to learn that it falls on the floor and he's going to learn that mommy and daddy gets very upset. Mm -hmm. So those are kind of two experiences for the type, for the present one. Now, his main, um, Mugen's main, uh, message is that the way children learn leads to adaptive and flexible thinking. And that's very different from the brittle thinking that machines are doing, or at least until now. It's, uh, they, they have they can slice and dice all this data, but they don't have the process with which children learn that makes the whole distinction. Um, he believes that this is, this, this are, iterations that go over obviously a heuristic process so you, they learn more and more it's sort of like a mm -hmm. vortex where you know the curiosity of war, vortex where you know it expands and whatever it it comes around is going to suck in so it's sort of like a very um, it's it's not an algorithmic way of learning um, and he believes that we should encourage this type this curiosity that is very specifically human because that's how they learn. And one of the ways to doing that is through problem solving. Uh, it's to identify problems uh, and, and figure out what are the different ways that people have or, or can approach a problem to solve it. Um, and again, that teaches them that there are different solutions for different contexts. So one of the things that he's talking about is, for instance, uh, if we're, well, this is my example. If you, if you teach them about, okay, so now they found out that the water is coming out. Now why is the water coming out? Well, there's a big pipe structure, you know, under our houses there, you know, combining all of the households with water sources. So, but is that a universal law? No, it's not. So, you know, explain to the child that there might be villages in other parts of the world where you have to actually go to a water source with a big bucket, carry it on your head, bring it back. So, one thing I find is interesting is that he wants us to take them into the future. He wants to teach them about the past and how people solved problem in the past and why it was rational for them to solve it one way versus another way. But he also wants us to, to take them into the future. And, and if there's one, one goal that we do with the clients is to make the clients view problem solving from a, a future context, from, from a time period that is going to be different from today. So that's part of that adaptive thinking that uh, he stresses. Um, based on experiences, based on these many iterations of, of experiences, children learn by analogies. They can draw associations to things that have happened in the past. And something interesting happens then, because again, this is something that computer architecture can, can do. So the computers can slice and dice the data and they can apply these uh, probability formulas and, and try and algorithms and try to come to an answer. But they cannot really do associations the way these free associations that humans do. So 
this guy, I mean, he knows what it feels, what it is to feel hunger, right? He knows what the what a cookie tastes like. He can do all of these associations. So he remembers, <coughs> I'm hungry, and I remember, I, I wish I had a cookie that made him think of his grandma, because maybe she gave him a cookie, and uh, and and there was an icicle there during Christmas, and then. And then he had a science experiment, and then the teacher had funny glasses. The, the machine can't even understand the concept of humor. Like the, the, the uh, teacher had funny looking glasses. So these are the, this is the stuff that creativity is made out of. And still, computers cannot do it. It seems to be very, very difficult to actually teach uh, machines to do that particular mental exercise. Um, and so I did I actually did a little bit of uh, googling beyond the these particular books to specifically on embodiment because that seems to be such a hot topic in and by itself. Do we need to have a body to to have these vast? Um, I mean, can can you reverse engineer the brain and and put it into a machine that doesn't have a body? Does that really work? Because is there something? that we learn that is dependent on the sensory experiences. And it turns out that's the most important thing. There's this uh, movement uh, in, the, um, in the AI uh, community that is talking about this embodiment. It's called the embodiment movement. And that's where they discuss if uh, the sensory input is, is, this, is so essential that you cannot replicate the human brain. It's that important. Um, and which sort of brings us to this interesting question, I think, anyway. So you have Moore's law, you know, the idea that um, transistors can double uh, every every second year, a transistor can double in an integrated surface, and that that theory has been expanded to comprise a processing speed and uh, storage power and memory, and even the price uh, or the cost of genome is kind of following Moore's law. But the thing is, it's a, it's an it's an ex exponential curve, but it's a difference in degree. And that's the problem we have. It's a difference in degree. It doesn't mean that they're getting closer to us necessarily. It can't necessarily replicate us. And that's where Moravec's paradox comes in, which postulates that you can, a machine intelligence can do a, a, a whole lot of reasoning, but they cannot do the most, oh, do the most essential that even toddlers can do, and that's based on sensory uh, experiences. And so what Moravec said was that over the course, over our uh, evolutionary history, we have developed um, a sense of a body, and we, we learn so much through just being ourselves, and being in this physical human body that is very difficult for, um, for for a computer to learn. And I just for fun, I wanted to to um, pull up a picture to Google image search, which I know is not um, posted online. This is a picture of me and my daughter, and we're kind of tilted to the side. And so I asked Google, what do we look like? What are we visually similar to? And Google thinks we look like food. <laughs> <laughs> And a cockroach. So <laughs> and a cockroach. <laughs> and a cockroach. So that's what Google thinks. And I, I think that if me and my daughter lived off eating eating little Googles in the jungle, Google would not survive. Because he Google cannot recognize that we're a face. And that's so important for human survival that we can recognize fast, easily. You know, what is this? We don't necessarily remember like he Google can remember all the codes for all of the colors and the shades and everything, but we don't need that for human survival. So I just thought that was an interesting little experience, and it made uh, it created a lot of laughter around my house when I heard this. So, so moving over to the threats in the second machine age, um, you know, one one thing, this idea if computers are going to replace us is really only part of the discussion. Because, yeah, automation, I mean, Karl Marx was talking about automation back in the 19th century. He was talking about, you know, the manual laborers being replaced by the machines. So this is not necessarily something new. What is new is some of the other structures that are being caused by it. That consumption is no longer so dependent on 
human labor in form of production uh, based on human labor input. Because now that we can make digital replica, you have a prototype, and then there's no cost for whatever replica you make or whatever that is. It doesn't cost anything. So there's, there's no humans that are taking part in that value creation. And, um, and, and that's a lot of what I get out of the second machine age. And I feel like that's what Jeremy Rifkin is talking about in his book as well. Um, and and what, it, what happens then is that we, we get to this, with globalization, we get to this winner-take-it-all society. So if you take the example of universities, like in the past, a very, very good professor was limited to having how many can you fit into an auditorium, maybe 100 students. Now, when you have Coursera and you have Udacity and they're lining up with some of whoever, whichever professor is getting in contact with them, can have a vast, much, much, much broader outreach and reach so many more people. And, and of course the MOOCs are free, but if you put that into a price model, um, that particular professor will suddenly make all the money and then all the other ones are sort of, nobody needs them anymore. So I think that's the main takeaway from, from Brynjolfsson and McAfee. They're talking about bounty and spread. And bounty indicates that there are increases, there's so much we can do, you can increase in volume, in variety, there's, it's so easy to sort of <coughs> in limitless, in limitless production of certain, at least uh, intellectual uh, or um, information material. Um, and the spread relates to the fact that there is a widening disparity between the haves and the have-nots, which is just endemic to that, that um, economic, social economic model. So that is what um, the second, I believe, is the main takeaway from that. And so we see it here in this. Uh, these are uh, median incomes for regular families, regular households, and this is GDP. So we see that production keeps going up. And I think that's what we've seen since the recession is that the production keeps going up, but the uh, the income stays pretty uh, low. Um, and uh, Rifkin calls it from freemiums to premiums. That this has been the model, like the transitional model. How do we make money in this economy, especially if you're an information worker, where you start putting things out for free. Like, <coughs> I'm going to give you a little bit for free, and I hope that what you're going to do is sign up for my premium, sort of my paid service. Um, he believes that is a naive model. It had uh, the music industry has done this for a long time. You know, charge giving away the, the music, but having people sign up for concerts. Uh, he believes specifically that the um, the publishing industry is uh, is not helping them at all. So he he, he does not support this New York Times um, uh, revenue model where you can read uh, ten articles a month and then uh, and, and then you have to subscribe after that because simply there's such a ubiquity of information out there. So so those are some of those issues that have to be discussed. So you, you referred to the situation where the, the winner takes all. Yeah. And I think New York Times is a good example of that. Uh, I pay the New York Times. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine paying you know, I pay the Economist and the New York Times. I won't be paying anybody else. Uh, and but and they can do pretty well because I don't live in New York, and uh, I'm not going to get a paper. Well, I could get a paper copy from them too, obviously. But uh, the point is, yeah, there's so many people, and if only uh, a tiny percentage uh, sign up, then that can work for them. But it can't work for the Denver Post or the Statesman or the every paper, paper out there. Right. Exactly. And I think that's, um, I remember what, uh, one of my friends came down to uh, South by Southwest and had a panel on streaming in the music industry and it was the same problem. And they had broken down, uh, looked, looked at, uh, the, done some market research on the people who are streaming things like Spotify 
and what there are, or I think they have, in Europe they have some streaming services where you can pay if you want to and you don't have to. <laughs> And I think it was, you, you get a little bit of an extra perk if you pay for it, but if you, if you don't, you, you kind of get a pretty good service anyway. And so I think that's, that model might not survive because there's simply uh, such an outpour of creative content. So we'll see if that is going to, what's going to win, the premiums or the ubiquity of free information. So, after sort of reading these books and uh, looking at a lot of online um, uh, videos and from, from presentations that these authors have had in the past, what came to me is that, well, there's a lot of <coughs> value that is being created all the time. Are we only discussing blue collar or white collar, for one thing? I mean, that, that is really where you limit the discussion right now, because I made this slide on Mother's Day. And <laughs> when I look at these, these uh, presentations, I've, some of the most notable things that I see is that there are very few caretakers of people who spend most of their days doing caretaker work. Whether you're a mother or a father or a daughter or a son or a spouse, they, these are business people. So if you ask a woman who's been raising children and, you know, you know, for eons almost. Um, are you creating value? Of course I'm creating value. It's just not reflected in the GDP. Um, and, and you know, we now have that opportunity. Now that we can outsource some of our functions uh, and still make money, at least on a societal level, um, by, by having the machines come and help us, we have functions that still need to be done. You cannot replace a mother. I mean, I'm sorry, you cannot. You can have as many robots and computers as you want, but you can't replace uh, the human touch. And I wanted to say something. Obviously, we have huge uh, green jobs ahead of us if we could just monetize it. I mean, there's, think of everything that needs to be done just, just to kind of get the infrastructure together to live in a more green world or all the cleanups. I have a story I wanted to tell you guys. Uh, there's. A friend, I have a friend who's an oceanographer, and she has recently been writing a book about jellyfish, because jellyfish is one of those few species that can survive all the mess we're doing to the oceans. And so while she got um, stuff for her book, she was traveling around in the United States, and she went to Oregon, and she talked to um, a woman who's an artist. What this woman did is, she was concerned with all of the debris that was washing up on the shore because you know the Pacific Ocean is like a big gyro trash. And she saw all of this coming up, up on the shore. She wanted to repurpose some of that and create sculptures. So she wanted to create sea animals and the ones that replicas of the animals that are now being threatened by all of the trash we're dumping into the ocean. She actually found debris coming in all the way from China. You know. um, and, but she needed a way to get the debris that would function as the you know, building blocks of her sculptures. So she saw all these people on the beach, beach combers, you know, picking uh, stones and shells. And she thought, if I could just get them to pick up the debris for me, that would be, that would be great, because I can't get it all. And so what she did is she uh, hooked up with some of the uh, local businesses. And together, they came up with these punch cards so that if you came with a certain amount of trash for her, you could you would get punches in your cart, and then you could get like maybe a pizza delivery or a spa treatment to some something like that. And they ended up relieving you know something like three tons of garbage. And some of these sculptures are down in Sea World. So if you guys go to Sea World, if you're taking children or, or or relatives or anybody, please have a look at them because they're beautiful. And and I just. After I learned the backstory of that, I, I thought, well, this is not reflected in GDP, but it could be. <laughs> there's no reason it should not be. Um, so, uh, so, so I think that there's a lot of work that humans can still be very instrumental in. It's just that we have we don't have a moni monitor system that reflects it. We need to do something on the political level to get that done. I also wanted to um, put in. Yellow, coll yellow collar uh, are people who work in the creative industries. 
So again, that the Mugen's perspective, you know, that we have certain cap capabilities as human, at least still, that the, the, the computers cannot take away from us. So we can sort of go more into that area. So, so with that, I just kind of want to throw the ball over to you guys because um, I, I know that you guys can definitely add so much insight to this discussion. And uh, this was just to kind of provide a backdrop to uh, a, a problem we're not going to solve tonight, but <laughs> so.